Fala, fiotes! Eu sou o Kalil e você está no Gamer Liu Games. Bem-vindo mais uma vez. E hoje é o seguinte, galera. A IGN, né? Eles fizeram toda uma cobertura sobre Dragon's Dogma 2. Jogaram 10 horas aí pra mais. E neste vídeo, eles soltaram, né? Ontem, na verdade, um vídeo comentando sobre as 10 horas. Só que dessa vez... É, aparentemente é mais uma conversa né, que eles estão tendo entre eles e eu resolvi fazer um react desse vídeo, ver com vocês para ver se tem alguma novidade, alguma coisa que nós não sabemos, o que eles gostaram e o que eles não gostaram, né? E eu te convido a assistir agora comigo, tá? Seja muito bem-vindo, espero que você esteja gostando da cobertura que nós estamos fazendo. O jogo tá chegando, né? Estamos aí há pouco mais de um mês, né? Um mês e meio aí pra chegada do game. E se Deus quiser, a gente vai se divertir muito com ele aqui. Absolutamente, cara, eu tenho, eu tenho, eu tenho certeza absoluta que esse jogo aqui vai ser um dos grandes jogos do ano, em todos os sentidos, né? <risos> e eu acho que a gente vai gastar boas horas, felizes horas, aqui no canal. Então vamos lá, vamos ver o que eles estão falando. Mediante o que eles forem conversando e tal, a gente vai pausando, vai analisando e trocando uma ideia, tá bom? Bora lá, então. What's up, everyone? Mitchell Saltzman here, alongside Casey DeFridis from all the way across the country. How are you doing, Casey? I'm good. How are you? Happy to be here. I'm doing great too. And so I figure what we what we can do here is tie a little bow on our coverage of Dragon's Dogma 2. We did a gameplay reveal, we've done interviews, we've done a preview, but what we haven't really done is just done a conversation to talk about the 10 hours that we spent at Capcom in Japan playing Dragon's Dogma 2. So Casey, why don't you kick us off? Tell us a little bit about what we played. I always love when we have the opportunity to do this for previews where you basically start from the beginning of the game and then you can just play and see how far you get. I, I think it really gives you a better sense of what Nossa, the game pela is dama. going to be like rather than playing like bits and pieces of the game like chosen for you, you know? And like 10 hours, it's an incredibly long time to be able to get a handle of what the game is. And for Dragon's Dogma 2, we didn't start immediately from the actual beginning, but maybe 10 or 15 minutes into the game. Um, you, the story starts right off the bat. You have amnesia, you don't know who you are, but you are probably the Arisen because pawns listen to you and you're able to summon your main pawn at the Riftstone right off the bat. So that's kind of where we started. And then you make it to, you need to go to the city of Vermund to prove you either are or are not the Arisen, but everyone keeps it on the down low. And right off the bat, you meet someone who becomes your kind of connection to the city. I think his name is Brent. Um, and he's the one who introduces you with the quests and with what is going on in the world. Yeah, and it's kind of like uh, the, in the first game where <clears throat> your your connection to Brent kind of ties you into the main quest. So every time you want <laughs> to go do the main quest, you talk to Brent, he has a selection of main quests that you can choose mm. to follow. And uh, it's it's cool to have that separation of like, this is clearly the main quest, and then everything else is clearly side content. One of the things I... Tá, vejamos se eu entendi. A gente começa o jogo, estamos com amnésia, não sabemos quem somos, encontramos um peão, ele fala que nós somos o, o Horizon, né? E aí nos leva para um lugar para nos provar isso, certo? Uh, e aí vamos encontrar com esse Brent, que é o cara que vai nos dar as missões principais. Eu achei interessante isso que ele falou, e ele também tá comentando isso. Que existe o fato de tudo que você quiser fazer de main quest, de main quest pelo menos do tempo que eles jogaram, é só ir lá falar com o Brent, que tem várias missões que a gente vai fazer. Fora ele, tudo e qualquer coisa que fizermos será missão secundária e tal. Legal, pelo menos a gente tem uma direção de onde ir para continuar as missões principais. É o que ele tá falando, né? Vamos ver se, pra, se mais pra frente continua sendo assim. Eu acho que é muito, muito impressionante sobre Dragon's Dogma 2 é como tudo se sente muito natural e orgânico em termos de... Legal, tudo natural, orgânico, como as missões secundárias acontecem. E vamos falar um pouco mais sobre as melhorias que eu acho que de Dragon's Dogma 2 sobre o primeiro jogo, do que nós vimos. Mas eu quero voltar um pouco a um pouco e... Uh, just talk a little bit more about the story and how like that initial story hook is so strong. Right from the start, you know, you know what you're doing, you know uh, what the state of the world is. Everything feels a lot more kind of built up right from the start. It's not being built as it goes. You, you kind of get the full scope of the world 
right from the beginning, and it, it kind of grounded me more in the the plot of Dragon's Dogma 2, more so than I was in the, in the first game. Um, but yeah, I don't know. How did you feel about that? No, I feel exactly the same way. I feel like immediately your character is entangled in the geopolitical issues of the world and you become very aware of what is happening very quickly and the way they introduce those characters to you does happen naturally as well you're not you the first time you enter the town and you go to the inn you leave the inn and a boy runs into you and that ends up being very important down the line and it's just organic things that you might not necessarily think is important, but down the line becomes important. And I thought it was very interesting from the start that they give you these basic adventuring quests that are part of the main quest, like go and cull a bunch of monsters. But then you also have quests that are infiltrate the, t the town's castle to find more about people's political intentions. And I found that really interesting. I also found those quests incredibly challenging as well. But because of that, you know what's going on, you know what your role is in the plotline very early. Oh, legal, cara. Então é interessante. Tô, assim, eu não sei vocês, né? Mas eu gosto de fuçar muito em games. E já percebi pelo que ela tá falando aqui que qualquer coisa que nos for chamada a atenção é interessante verificar, é interessante dar uma olhada. Porque nesse caso que ela tá falando aqui, ela acabou descobrindo mais sobre o mundo, mais sobre a história do jogo, mais sobre a lore e mais sobre o papel, né, do seu personagem no game, simplesmente por seguir ali um garoto que veio falar com ela e tal e não sei o quê. Provavelmente não é a missão principal, mas é uma opção que o jogo te dá. Então, assim, eu não sei vocês, mas todo e qualquer NPC que me parar, me falar alguma coisa e me der uma opção diferente de sair do meu ponto central para ir para alguma coisa diferente fazer, eu vou abandonar o meu ponto central, a minha missão principal e vou seguir esses caras, vou ver o que eles têm para me dizer e para me ensinar, porque eu acredito que vai ser muito bom, né, para entendermos o game e para a própria imersão, né, do jogador. Comenta aí, o que, que você vai fazer? Eu, eu gostei disso aí. And it's yeah. a very important one. <laughs> I, I will say that that castle quest was probably the, the one sour <laughs> spot that I had over the course of this this whole play session, just because it's it's kind of like a stealth mission, and uh, Dragon Song Dragon Song Two doesn't really have any stealth mechanics, so uh, it, it's the kind of thing where you're supposed to find like a disguise, but you know Dragon Song Two doesn't really tell you a lot of these things. It's it's a game that doesn't hold your hand, and I appreciate that a lot about it. It's the kind of game where I, I like to say side quests, you don't seek out side quests, they come to you. Mm -hmm. right. um, it's, it's the kind of game where you look at your map and it's not cluttered with all kinds of items. You know, you're not going from you know, icon to icon to clear out an area. You, you go in a direction, a pawn will like, you know, point you like, hey, there might be a quest over here. You yeah, this is it, man. You have like, your own little. Adventure right there with that é desse jeito mesmo, galera. Quando eu fui convidado pela Capcom Brasil para poder testar Dragon's Dogma 2 lá em São Paulo, é... eu comecei, o jogo falou, ó, você tá no mundo e vai, tá ligado? Em nenhum momento eu tive ajuda do mapa, né? Ou dos próprios desenvolvedores que estavam lá, super gente boa, os caras. É, não tive, porque a ideia do jogo, pelo que eu entendi, é exatamente essa. Né? Você faz o que você quiser e explora o que você quiser. Então eu abri o mapa e ele tava do jeito que o cara mostrou aqui, ó. Não tem ponto mostrando onde, onde você vai, o que você vai fazer. O máximo que pode acontecer é você tá andando e os seus peões, né, falar alguma coisa do tipo, olha, aqui tem tal coisa, vamos lá. E aí você vai, ó, oh, aqui tem tal coisa, vamos seguir por aqui e você vai. Do resto, mano, é exploração por conta nua e crua. Vai ser uma experiência diferente pra mim, eu confesso. Mas eu tô muito ansioso pra sentir isso, né, por mais horas. Eu joguei só uma horinha desse game que vocês estão vendo, né, mas com certeza jogando mais a gente vai ter uma percepção melhor do que tá rolando, mas... Já digo pra vocês que é bem parecido mesmo. É exatamente né, o que eles estão falando aqui. O jogo não te pega pela mão mesmo, não. Te joga no mapa e você só vai. É isso. É tudo orgânico. Não é ruim, tá? Isso não é ruim. Pawn. Se você não está familiar com como isso funciona no primeiro jogo, isso basicamente... Meu único ponto negativo, você já sabe o que é. Eu já falei, já reclamei. <risos> Vamos embora. Da mesma maneira, pawns são esses seguidores que você tem e... They basically come from the internet. 
uh, every every person who plays this game will make their own pawn. Ó, oh, mesmo esquema do primeiro, recrutando o peão dos outros. From, from the, you know, their home game. So if they have experience, é, igual no primeiro. Quest, they'll be able to tell you like, hey, like I've done this quest. There's a shortcut over here, or you know, there's a. There's Isso a, é muito a, único desse jogo, jogo, né, cara? Isso é muito quest. legal. And then you just follow them eu sei que a maioria de vocês que está acompanhando aqui já sabem disso até mais do que eu, né? Mas caso você ainda não saiba, nunca tenha jogado nem nada. Cara, você joga com um personagem e é acompanhado por mais três bots, né? É um peão que é o seu principal e mais dois que você pega do mundo, se eu não estiver enganado, é isso. Quando você pega esses peões do mundo, não são bonecos aleatórios, eles são os peões principais de outras pessoas que realmente estão jogando. Da mesma forma, o seu peão né, ele pode ser disponibilizado para outras pessoas. Acontece que, digamos que eu comece a jogar agora, e eu pegue emprestado um peão lá de um cara que está muito mais avançado que eu e já fez várias missões. Quando eu chegar nessas missões com esse peão do cara, e, e a, como o cara já fez a missão que eu estou chegando... Esse peão ele vai me dar dicas sobre o lugar e sobre como concluir aquela missão. Porque ele já aprendeu com o cara original dele lá que como fazer né, todo o procedimento. Aí ele chega aqui, você que não sabe, ele vai te dar dica. Cara, isso aí eu acho muito único de Dragon's Dogma, é muito legal. E é um ponto super fora da curva do game, né? Isso é muito bacana. The pawn system worked in Dragon's Dogma 2. Yeah, I really appreciated the the pawn system as well. I thought it, I like this in the original Dragon's Dogma as well, but I, like you said, I feel like it works even better in Dragon's Dogma 2, and I feel like there's more customization to the pawns. There's like more to the pawn system overall oh, customization than there was in the original Dragon's Dogma. But anyway, I really prefer the way this game handles um, getting you from point A to point B versus a lot of other games. You're not following an icon on the map. Ah, não tá not seguindo uma... nada no mapa. Unnatural line. It's either you bring up your map and you look at it and it's like, all right, it's northwest. I guess I'll figure it out. Um, or you find a pawn that already knows what they're doing. And the pawn system allows ah you to um, sort based on if a pawn knows anything about this quest that you are currently on. Which I found very helpful. One other thing about the the pawn system is that you can you know give them a vocation, and I wanted to kind of go into the vocation system uh, in this game because we did mm -hmm. experience that differently. Um, because I ended up playing as warrior, uh, fighter, and sorcerer, and you spent mm -hmm. the entirety of your, the entirety of your time playing as a thief. And so because mm -hmm. none of our coverage really covered the thief, I really wanted to dive into your thoughts yeah. on. The thief as a uh, as a class and what you what you thought yeah. about it. I really enjoyed the thief. So in the original Dragon's Dogma, I, I eu acho também uma das mais legais, mano. Rápidas. You to use both the bow and arrow and uh, I wanted to say dual blades, but daggers, two but two daggers. And in Dragon's Dogma 2, they split that class into both the archer and the thief because I I think they there was a quote that they said that class was a little bit too strong. Um, for a base starting class. There is another class, Mystic Spearhand, that you'll be able to unlock eventually that does have long range and close range capabilities, but I guess for a base class, they wanted to uh, make it a little bit more basic. But I still felt Faz sentido. very capable immediately from the get-go. Um, you're immediately given um, core skills that are already on your map, so they are on your face buttons, rather. And I felt able to go in and out of combat very agilely, very quickly. And I felt um, it's a, I felt like a rogue. Like it was just, that's just how it is. And you eventually unlock, um, well, you already have an ability from the get-go called Twin Daggers, which if you sneak up or if the enemy does not perceive you and you hit them with that attack, it does Uma das classes que eu pude testar na minha demonstração foi realmente, né, o o ladrão, né, tal, e cara, sem dúvida, uma das que eu mais gostei, a que eu mais gostei foi a lutador, né, e depois, porque tem ali o escudo, a espada, né, o padrãozão, tal, 
E em segundo lugar foi, sim, sem dúvida, né, o, o, o ladrão e tal. Porque ele é muito rápido, galera, é muito rápido. Tinha hora que eu me... Como o jogo ele não tem um, um lock, um travamento, né, pelo menos eu não... Nada fica aparente na tela que você tá travado ou não, né. Cara, direto eu me perdi, eu tava batendo no cara aqui, daqui a pouco o cara virava e eu continuava indo pra lá, eu indo pra cá, porque ele é muito rápido, saca? E os golpes, esse golpe que ele dá de giradinha, assim, tira muita vida e é muito bom contra inimigos alados, porque na minha, na demo onde eu testei, tinha muitos inimigos que voavam, né, aquelas arpias, aquele bagulho todo lá, e dá esse pulo, girando, detonava tudo eles, derrubava no chão pra que os peões vinsse e, é, chegar, chegassem, né, e detonasse tudo, é bem legal, bem legal mesmo, essa super indico, quem quiser começar a jogar, testar, Dando esse personagem porque eu gostei bastante. Does more damage. That's very rogue like, right? Very thief like. And then you unlock additional skills for one that lets you kind of like cover yourself in mud and lower your enemy's ability to perceive you, which makes it easier to get that extra damage bonus from sneaking up on them with the twin damage. Legal. And it became very um it reminded me of what I would do as a rogue in a DD campaign <laughs> where I would uh um do that uh move to kind of cover me and then trying to sneak up behind the group of enemies while the rest of my party Ah, o inimigo não vendo ele porque tá coberto de lama, ó. Chega e finaliza. It was a really fun class the whole time. It works a little bit differently than the Strider. With the Strider, uh I assume everyone else did this, but I kind of really abused the Helm Splitter uh, attack, which lets which deals more damage if you are attacking from above. But the move this time around works a little bit differently where it launches you really high up into the air. So if you're attacking something that's smaller, you're not getting all of the hits off. So you can't really rely on that one move to deal your damage the way I did in the original Dragon's Dogma. But this encourages you to, ex to um, experiment with other moves and new moves. And there's so much to choose from and so many, there's a lot of options and a lot of customizability, even just for the, for the thief. And every vocation now has a vocational ability that's tied to them. Yes. So what's unique about the thief is that they are the only class that I've seen so far that actually has a dodge button. Um, yeah, so we, it's the, the quick step. Right, they have a quick step. And I don't know if it has iframes, but, you know, even if it doesn't, just the ability to quickly get out of the way of, of attacks is a huge benefit to, to that class. Because if you, if you want to get out of the way real quickly of something as a... É verdade a war, isso. You basically you have can't. to just... <laughs> Start a sprint. <risos> é verdade isso. E eu até assustei porque eu não sabia, né? Que cada um fazia um comando diferente ali. Eu não me lembro se é no, no, nos gatilhos. Mas, por exemplo, com o, o lutador, quando você apertava o gatilho e tal... Não me lembro se é esse o botão, tá? Mas se apertava o gatilho, ele defendia. O ladrão, ao invés de defender, ele dá um... Um sprint, né? Que eles estão falando aqui. E isso ajuda muito, cara. Isso ajuda muito. Um, but yeah, so, a, a, to kind of talk about the, the vocations I played, um, Fighter felt probably the most similar to everything else that I, uh, or to, to how the Fighter was in the first game. Um, the big thing about the Fighter is that they are the only class that has a shield. A lot. Again, as far as I know so far. Um, mm -hmm. So you can, you know, use the shield to parry attacks. Um, they have very, very strong melee capabilities. There's a new system in the game where if you basically stun an enemy, né, melee attack, é da hora. Them up to an execution uh, that just instantly kills them. I believe it also gives you some invulnerability while you're in the middle of the execution animation. It's like this really good hit stop effect. It feels really good. And then you have the warrior. The warrior was. Isso aí não know, tinha para eu testar. It, there was a lot of people talking about my warrior gameplay and how it wasn't. It wasn't very good. Uh, For the record, that was very early game warrior gameplay. I didn't have a lot of skills. There's some footage later on that hopefully I can cut in some B-roll of uh, right now. But the big thing <laughs> about prove. the warrior... Yeah, to, to prove that I'm not that bad at this game. Uh, no, but the, the warrior, I think the, the really cool thing about this class is that, yes, it's a class that's focused on slow hits golpes uh, lentos e lentos e danosos né uh, that you can kind of just you know bully through light attacks and just you know take a few to, to do one big shot of your own uh, but the big new thing about it is that there's cabreiro da hora later in the vocation that allows you to time button presses with your attacks and so if you like time an attack press just as your your attack hits 
you'll instantly go into your next attack. I like carregando o golpe. Going, like, you know, you're just cutting through things like this if you're able to time it. Um, and you deal huge damage um, because, you know, again, the warrior is a class that's all about big damage but slow attack. Oh, yeah. And they also have this skill that lets them, um, you know, negate some of that disadvantage. If Olha ele juntando, ó, pô. Olha o tanto de vida que comeu. Vocês viram esse ataque? And uh, and yeah, I just I love I love the warrior class. I, one of the things I always say about Dragon's Dogma to or Dragon Do Dragon's Dogma vocations, excuse me, is that they are kind of the peak fantasy of these well-known archetypes. So mm -hmm. you know, the, the warrior is the, the peak fantasy of that gut style character that has a yeah. great story. It's <laughs> just like charging it up for like 10 seconds, and then he releases it and just. It's like an explosion happens without any kind of fire or, or uh, explosion effects. Uh, just it feels that that powerful when you hit it. And then you have the sorcerer who you know charges up a spell for like 25 seconds, and when you release that spell, it looks like a spell you charged up for 20 20 something seconds. And then you, know, you have the the thief who you know is darting back and forth doing these really quick attacks. Oh, golpe lá que eu falei para vocês, ó, que vai batendo em tudo quanto é lado e quem tiver na frente toma lá. Olha o dashzinho. Um, really, really strong. It's a really, really strong class system and uh, mm -hmm. one of the best I've I've played in in open world RPGs. And I do especially appreciate the vocation system as well because you can freely change your vocations, Olhei. which is fantastic. I feel like usually I I'm like sweating when I'm choosing my original vocation or class or whatever in games because it's like oh this is it this is all I'm going to get. But in Dragon's Dogma, you can always be like, you know what? I'm kind of tired of being a thief. I'm going to be a mage and then yeah. go and change your vocation. And Legal, you say, build yeah. up that, those points and levels again to make your mage class as strong as your thief class was. But it's still a very doable endeavor. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of like Final Fantasy XIV that also allows you to kind of master everything if you wanted to. It's not, it's not quite that intensive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one other thing that I think we should clarify, uh, you know, you have those four base classes and then you yes. have the advanced versions of those classes but the way you the... get those advanced versions of those, those classes is not by leveling up the the base class you actually get a quest mm -hmm. that sends Olha aí, you a gente já viu. Way. Olha aí, a gente já viu isso aqui, né, em vídeos anteriores, mas é legal eles estarem re repetindo, né, para enfatizar como funciona. Estou lá usando uma classe X. Eu tenho a parte avançada dessa classe, que é outra classe, né? Vocação, no caso. Não basta eu subir de nível para poder ir lá e conseguir, né? Desbloquear. É através de missões. Você vai receber uma missão do tipo: ah, busque um cajado. Beleza. A gente pega essa missão, vai lá buscar um cajado e quando a gente consegue o cajado, é liberado pra gente a vocação de mago. Um negócio assim, tá ligado? Isso é legal, é legal. É legal porque incita os jogadores a sair buscando e fazendo tudo quanto é missão que for aparecendo, né? Principalmente essas de buscar armas, tal. Weapon of that class and you bring it back to the the vocation master basically and then you unlock the uh, that vocation. I don't know if that's the case for everything. We only got to unlock the warrior and sorcerer uh, vocations in our in our playtime. The trickster was a special build that they just, you know, teleported us to basically. Yeah. Um, so we don't that know. It was a very exactly. high level. Yeah. I think it was maxed out. We, we I, got to I, play I don't, maxed out I don't know. I don't know if it was if every single thing was maxed out. We we had like the highest versions of the skills that we had equipped. So like mm -hmm. the 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 move that sends out a fog that you know gets you like aggro. Suffocating that, shroud. Suffocating shroud. That probably had like the max range on it. You know, when you first start off with the trickster, that might not have as you know wide a radius. We don't exactly know how all the other vocations will be unlocked. If they are the same as the warrior and sorcerer, it seems like you do a quest, you bring back a weapon to the the vocation master, and then you unlock the vocation. We didn't get to play any Mystic Spearhand, which was a bummer for me, but we did get a good quote from uh, Itsuno-san that basically was saying that the class is they like to call it Akuma balancing at Capcom. <laughs> where it is, it's focused on dealing big damage, but at the expense of taking a lot, or like having very little, you know, life. Um, it's <laughs> basically a glass cannon build, um, and I'm very excited for that one. That's probably the one I'm gonna, you know, try out when I when I first get my hands on this game. 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. I had a um, Blade Song wizard uh, character in D and D, and it, it kind of looks like it plays like a Mystic Spear hand. <laughs> so yeah. I'm very curious and uh, checking out what that feels like in a game. Um, moving on from vocations, I wanted to double back a little bit about the exploration um, because as we talked about, I feel like there are two emerging there are two schools of open world design. You've got the Assassin's Creed style of design where you just like you know put everything on a map uh, and you know the player gets to you know go to every marker and feel like okay I've done everything Total. in this area I've crossed off all the side quests I've you know yeah. done all the, the minor collectibles Assassin's is like man else. and then there's kind of this emerging school of like Elden Ring and Breath of the Wild where you know the map is is pretty barren and it's on you to kind of fill in the markers as you as I you see. Know, find stuff and Dragon's Dogma definitely goes more towards the the new school of like Elden Ring and, and Breath of the Wild but also it, it adds kind of its own little spin to it because there's very limited fast travel in this game um Casey what did you, what did you think about how you know the the distance works in this game and how you know how much you have to work to get from point A to point B. I found it so interesting how much the developers emphasize the importance of distance in their game whenever they talk to us. I think their first introduction, they talk mm -hmm. to us about how they want us to feel the difficulties of long distance, like long distance relationships or like getting to, like, do you want to go? I think one of the things they said, like, do you want to go to a restaurant that's closer to you is not or not as good or do you want to spend the extra time or money getting to a place that's really good and if it's that's if that will be worth it to you and their goal was to make the travel worth it despite the cost or risk as you said um Mitchell, mm -hmm. to get there and i definitely felt that a lot um the cost and or risk because as you said um fast travel is incredibly limited. So in order to do fast travel, you both need to have activated a port crystal, which are very limited and generally only in very large towns. And while we were playing, I had only activated one. And to teleport back to that port crystal in those towns, you need a fairy stone. And fairy stones are extraordinarily expensive and very rare. So it is a very real decision when you're like, wow, like I am out in the wilderness and I desperately need to go to an inn or I and really my equipment is not good for this area or like so many different things because when you're out in the wilderness the only way to rest is at a campsite but you can't do that without a camp pack either which is also a very expensive <laughs> resource you don't and generally heavy. find a lot of yeah they're so heavy <laughs> oh my god you just like brought back my I spent so much time doing inventory management because I didn't realize how heavy those camp packs are so there are real Olhei detriments to bringing resources é, cara, o jogo so dificulta mesmo nessas partes aí, mano. in the wilderness. So you kind of Quem tá acostumado não se importa, tá tudo bem. Very carefully when you're traveling and try to plan out. Mas quem tá chegando no mundo agora do jogo apanha. Because as you're traveling, the world has so much in it and I kept getting so distracted it took so long for me to get from point a to point b because i was like oh what's this what's that and discovering chests and fighting monsters and it wasn't so much that it was tipo basicamente né vocês estão prestando atenção vocês estão lendo mas só para fazer uma resenha em cima uh, basicamente ela tá dizendo para nós que esse lance né de você fazer viagem rápida até existe como no primeiro game só que é tudo muito Caro, muito, muito caro e muito pesado também. Por exemplo, uh, para você descansar né, e recuperar algumas coisas, life, esse tipo de coisa, você tem que montar um acampamento. Só que esse acampamento, além de ser muito caro, é muito pesado para se manter no inventário. E quando você usa ele, né, por exemplo, ator de noite lá, vou usar. Cara, você pode acordar e ter um baita inimigo lá do seu lado, porque o fogo ele vai chamar a atenção dos inimigos. Cara, é muito, muito real, né? E quanto a ter ou não ter viagem rápida, vocês já sabem a minha, minha opinião, né? Mas pra quem tá começando agora e não sabe e tal, cara, o... não tem, né? As viagens, ela, como, como ela acabou de falar aqui, 
são complicadas de se fazer pelo preço né, das pedras que são necessárias para você fazer essas transições e tal. E também você pode perder muito do que o mundo tem de oferecer. Ela mesmo, quando ela ia do ponto, 1, do ponto A ao ponto B, ela demorava horas para chegar até lá, porque no meio do caminho acontecia tantas coisas organicamente que ela parava para fazer, para ver, descobrir a quest, enfrentava monstro e tal. Então, é, é legal você ter a viagem rápida? Para mim, super legal, né? Até porque nem todo mundo tem tempo para ficar fazendo né, essas viagens extremamente demoradas. E existem, existem pessoas e pessoas, entendeu? Só que aqui o negócio vai ser assim mesmo. Né? Você vai ter que caminhar por um bom e longo tempo e vai descobrindo as coisas organicamente no mundo, que pode ajudar o seu personagem, deixar ele melhor, descobrir algo interessante que ninguém ainda descobriu e você compartilhar com as pessoas, esse tipo de coisa. Vamos ver, eu tô muito curioso pra ver qual vai ser o meu feeling mesmo jogando, sabe? Tendo que andar pra caramba, ou né, andando com coisas pesadas, como que vai ser o meu gerenciamento de inventário. Vai ser louco, mano, vamos ver. Exhausting? But it was enough to keep me very interested. It's ah the kind of game I feel Foi exaustivo, like mas manteve ela interessada. É isso que importa. Se mantém interessado, então ok. If you look at the game progress, it looks like it didn't make a, a lot of progress, but I had a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> When I think of Dragon's Dogma and and this the sequel, the word that comes to mind is bold. Um, there are a yeah. lot of bold decisions that Itsuno-san is making for this game. Uh, one of them is is fast travel. Concordo. Uh, You know, and, pra caramba. And I see, I see eu faria diferente. Like I definitely understand that he wants you to to really feel the distance that you are traveling. He wants you to feel that reward of going from one area to another area and you know the, the satisfaction of like you, you just fought through like hell to get here and it matters because you didn't just, you know, go to one spot realize you were out of supplies and jump back to town resupply jump back and then you know take another leg of the the, the journey or so to, so to speak It, it's it's a, a marathon uh you really mm -hmm. have to make sure that you are well prepared for any kind of expedition that you take outside the sea walls and it's a real powerful feeling that said <laughs> There are going to be people, I guarantee you, there are going to be people that are not going to be happy with the fact that they Eu? took maybe a 20 minute journey outside the city walls, fought a 20 ogre, minutos de um lugar a outro, às vezes. Like, their, their life is like this much because of yeah, that, that's... that incredible battle. And they have to, you know, Tem que voltar para a cidade, to, é. Vai ser louco. <laughs> um, so, I wanted to bring up real quick, now that you're talking about health, the loss gauge, gauge yeah. mechanic, which kind of makes Dragon's Dogma 2 a little bit of a survival game as well because of all of the reasons we were just talking about but because of every time you take damage or die <laughs> your health you lose your maximum Olha perde parte da da saúde máxima so even if you have all of the uh, herbs and potions and health Não volta. in the world you can't get back up to max health until you do a long rest <laughs> Até descansar bastante caraca velho It's scary <laughs> Well and then there's like the, the... The campfire mechanic that allows you to Brabo, hein? A vidinha dele ali embaixo ali, ó. E não sobe mais que isso. Because if you keep on going to the same campfire, you are going to attract the attention of monsters. Ah lá. Um, so you will wake up and you know a griffin might drop down on you and then you got to deal with the griffin. <laughs> and you know you can try to just run away from it, but you know that's not always the easiest thing to do. And, and I, I love that they do it because I, I keep making comparisons and parallels to D and D. I'm sorry, I just really like Dungeons and Dragons, but that is exactly what my DM would do to get you to move on. It's like you can't stay here and keep long resting; just continue, right. like go to the next spot, like get out of here in a very organic way that doesn't just. I like it feels so much better to deal with organic consequences than be like, oh, if you use the two. If you use the campfire too many times, you won't be able to use it again. Just the artificial um, disruption. Uh, the organic one feels a lot better. But I think, you know, in, in the end, it is one of those things that is kind of a, you know, what you lose and what you gain from, from that decision. I think you gain a lot Sim. from from the decision of not be, of having a limited fast travel system. Tá. Mas ainda eu acho que deveria ser opcional. O jogador decide, tá ligado? 
of having to, you know, walk for 20 minutes. Mas eu entendo, eu entendo. A town. Uh, because again, there's a lot of power in the the satisfaction that you get of making one of those successful expeditions and making progress that really wouldn't be there quite as strongly if there were a checkpoint that you could use to get yeah. back to town. Um, so the the big question, and I, I kind of ended my preview with this, is that will will that power still be there 50 hours into the game and I'm still doing all this? So I, I hope at some point there is an eternal fairy stone that you can get it's kind of like the thought of like putting in your hours and getting the reward of like okay you 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 did all of the back and forth you did all of concordo organic exploration here's your reward you... basicamente o que ele tá falando galera eu não joguei o primeiro tantas horas para descobrir se no primeiro existe isso tá mas basicamente por ele tá falando que não sabe e ele certamente jogou o primeiro então acho que não existe mas bom o que ele tá falando é o seguinte um, é legal, né? E eu concordo com ele que é legal esse lance de, tipo, você ir lá, né? E ter que descobrir as coisas organicamente, fazer toda a ida e volta de meia hora, uma hora, dependendo do lugar onde você tá, coisas que você tem que descobrir organicamente, você vai lá, faz, depois de uma hora você chega no seu objetivo, de tanta coisa que você acabou fazendo no meio do caminho, chega no meio do caminho, enfrenta um boss, sua vida fica um tiquinho, você tem que voltar, depois fazer de novo, beleza. Digamos que você fez tudo isso depois de, sei lá, mano, 40, 50, 60 horas, o jogo fale pra você, olha, ok, você jogou o jogo do jeito que nós queríamos e forçamos, essa é real, forçamos você a jogar. Então, beleza, já que você fez tudo isso, então pegue aqui essa pedra é, eterna, onde você vai poder fazer viagem rápida... Quantas vezes você quiser. Tipo, como uma recompensa por você ter jogado X horas do game. Porque a dúvida que fica é essa mesmo que ele falou. Depois de um bom tempo, você já jogando 50, 60, 70, 80 horas, com o um mapa extremamente grande, aberto por completo, imagina você chegar, você sair do lado A para ir pro lado B, literalmente o contrário do mapa, lá no final, né, caminhando, saca? Para pegar um item e voltar de novo. Então, tipo, sei lá... No começo, isso pode parecer até interessante, mas e depois que você já passou de 50, 70, 80, 100 horas? Isso vai continuar sendo interessante e gostoso? Não vai ser exaustivo em nenhum momento? Então eu concordo com ele. Depois de um bom tempo que você jogou do jeito que o jogo te força a jogar, seria legal alguma feature, alguma coisa que liberasse essas viagens rápidas de maneira... É, do jeito que você quiser, né? Sei lá. Desculpa. É, é alguém de fora falando, tá, pessoal? You can go the rest of the way with, you know, full fast track Allah. capabilities. So that's my hope. Um, but from what I, again, and I, I, I talked about this in my preview too. I enjoyed just about every minute that I played in this game. Um, except for that one mission that we talked about where you're yeah. infiltrating the castle. <laughs> that that mission made me feel like an idiot. Like, <laughs> I, I had the disguise and I made it all the way through and I misunderstood what the character told me. I guess I was supposed to jump out of a window and I just opened the door and they're still there. The guards are there and they're like... It's you. I, I got I got murdered and thrown into I not murdered, but I got beat and thrown into the prison um because I was a moron. So, yeah. thank you for that Dragon's Dogma <laughs> too. Uh one other thing that I wanted to talk about before we move on to like the trickster and the sphinx um is the 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 Jadeite orb quest that you that we yeah. both experienced. Um mm -hmm. Casey, can you tell us a little bit about what what that quest was for you? Yeah, so we As we've talked before, the side quests come up in Dragon's Dogma 2 so organically. You don't see uh, no the heads of NPCs that have a quest for you. You either like, go to a shop and talk to someone and they happen to have a quest for you, or you, because of course you're going to talk to the shopkeep, so it's a very natural place to put, or you're walking through the town and someone comes up to you and are like, hey, did you know you're being stalked? And they have a quest você. your stalker. And in this particular instance you I got to a town and talked to someone and they told me they tasked someone to collect an item for them and now they're missing and they want me to find that person to get the item for them and there that person's gonna be there's gonna be consequences for them if I turn them in like this and I get this quest and then I a little bit of time passes by and I meet someone new and it happens to be the guy who's missing with the item but he actually also lost the item so now Eesh. he wants me to go <laughs> find the item for him but 
he did have nefarious uh, intentions with it. He was going to sell it and run away with the profits and not tell his employer. So now you're kind of left with the decision, like who do you help? Legal. What do you do? Quem você vai ajudar, and né? The interesting thing about the side quest as well is the, the game doesn't tell you where to go or what to do and how to get this item. You kind of you just have to figure it out for yourself or you have to go find a pawn that's done it before. Olha and isso, I... mano. Olha isso. Olha como é que funciona. Olha a complexibilidade do negócio. E organici... organicidade, eu acho que é, né? Complexibilidade. Ó, ela tá mandando pela cidade, encontrou um cara, o cara falou que perdeu um item. Beleza. Que um cara pegou o item e vazou. Aí a gente chega, encontra o cara que pegou, só que esse cara também perdeu. E ele quer pegar esse item, vender e sair vazado sem contar pro cara que é o dono verdadeiro e tal. Fica a sua escolha ajudar um ou outro. Obviamente isso terá consequências que vão mudar o rumo da, do final do, da quest, né? Acontece que depois que você pega essa missão, não tem nada que te fala onde o bagulho está, mano. Você vai ter que fuçar o mapa do jogo por completo, a não ser que eles falem, né? Que tá próximo de alguma região, não sei o quê, mas eu acho que não fala. Ela tá falando aqui que, de duas, uma, você vai ter que procurar por conta ou você vai ter que encontrar um peão que já tenha feito essa missão pra ele te dar diretrizes. Olha isso, mano. find it very interesting whenever games give you choices like that. Let's really quickly touch upon the, the Trickster. Uh, this is a class I, I did a, a whole explainer video on. Casey, what are your thoughts on the Trickster class? Man, I the Trickster class I feel like has is going well. It does have an incredibly high skill ceiling. Um, so the Trickster class, you're not actually dealing damage with it. I do implore everyone to go and watch Mitchell's excellent Trickster breakdown video to really understand how the class works. But basically, it's about not dealing damage yourself, mm -hmm. and instead of controlling Chamar atenção the e distração. battlefield, your uh, strat strategician. Take this word. You're, strat you're just strategizing. Olha lá, so, enganando os caras e os caras indo tudo pulando yeah, lá, indo embora. The person who strategizes, you're pulling aggro, you are creating illusions, you are trying to direct the flow of battle and buffing your party while making, trying to take the attention off of them, while also doing things that disrupt things. So you have this one Bonito traje, called né? Dragon's Delusion, which is probably, it was, seemed very powerful. I used it against another monster that was just as big as the illusion i'm not i don't think i'm allowed to tell you what it is because i wasn't allowed to show that footage but it worked to great effect and knocked it back even though it's just é, então illusion. realmente it's coloca até os grandões de joelho com medo essa invocação do dragão a large creature you get a lot of free hits off on it and it can be a very powerful tool and the other thing you want to do with the trickster is put down illusions of floor over at the edge of a cliff and try and get them to attack your simulacrum. Eu vou experimentar, cara. Acho que deve <laughs> so ser interessante. You're not dealing damage, you're just making them jump off a cliff. So you don't even have to fight them. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a really cool class. Ó, você coloca a isca ali, ó. Eles vêm atrás, pulam e caem. <laughs> Legal isso aí. You know, dealing with bosses. Uh, Olha lá. Because a lot of a lot of it relies on uh, messing with AI, like the the enemy AI to get it to do something silly. Um, and the terrain. And yeah, and you know, getting it to jump off terrain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm very curious if you'll be able to do crazy things with it to like one shot a boss that otherwise is really really tough. Uh, but mm -hmm. it requires like a lot of setup and a lot of you know things going your way. Um, but yeah, a lot. That's all going to be stuff that we're going to have to experiment for ourselves with. Uh, and then we got this. We got to show the Sphinx. Uh, what did you think of the the Sphinx monster and, and all the little riddles that it had? Man, I I just I want to comment on the Sphinx design real quick. I love really the cool. design of the Sphinx. Like when look. you first meet her, she usually makes expressions that are pleasant and attractive, and then sometimes she makes these smiles that are just not human <laughs> and i think that just speaks to that she is i know she's right behind you she's really creepy but i love that the way they incorporated design elements from a lot of the different mythological um like cultures come from i mean you have like egyptian you have greek and there are different tellings of what the sphinx looks like and what they do and they kind of like pull that onto all together into the visual design of this monster and i find her very intriguing and beautiful and interesting and then talking to her is just such an experience. Um, she speaks, she gives you riddles. And the interesting thing with this is 
it's a one-time thing. If you mess up and give the wrong answer, like you don't have the opportunity to do it again. Yeah, as far really, as I'm kind of really yeah, one shot one. Touched upon, there is no manual save in Star Wars Two, or like there's no like li you can't just like everything is auto saved basically. So there's yeah. no. There's no like multiple saves that you can like, oh I'm about to make a decision with the Sphinx, I'm gonna save and you know yeah, yeah, one shot you can't do and that. You cannot control. Yeah, you yeah. can't turn off autosave. I'm terrified of this. I, I'm on the guides team. I mean you are too now, Mitchell, right? Mm -hmm. But uh yeah, I hate this. I love it as a player, but as a guide writer, I'm very scared. <laughs> it's a bold it's a bold, Total. Uh, it's a bold choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but... yeah, go on. Oh, I was just going to say fighting the Sphinx was also a really fun and unique experience. And I'm sure there's more to that fight que louco, than man. what I saw. I'm sure there, there's got to be an item somewhere that, that weakens her. <laughs> I just didn't have it in my inventory, I think. Uh, all right. Well, I think that kind of covers everything that we, we really saw during our uh, 10 hours of Dragon Song. With Caras, e é, e é so, isso, né? O vídeo deles é esse, aí meia hora aí contando, falando sobre a experiência né, que eles tiveram nessas 10 horas. Não sei se eles trarão mais coisas. Esse vídeo está com cara de conclusão né, de tudo. Até porque era o mês passado, né? E hoje, dia 1? Dia um, hoje, é, hoje é dia 1? Um? Deixa eu ver. Dia 2, na verdade, né? Então, eu acho que eles terminaram por aqui. Todavia, o jogo tá para chegar, né? E assim que tivermos novidades, qualquer coisa, galera, eu vou continuar trazendo aqui para vocês. Por hora, as impressões, embora eu tenha né, duas, três ressalvas cabreiras aí para o meu gosto pessoal, né, eu acho que, sim, termina ainda assim positivo. O jogo tem tudo para ser um dos jogos mais jogados né, da Capcom. E eu espero que seja, sim, um, um dos grandes jogos desse ano no geral. Vamos saber quando jogarmos e, claro, se o jogo chegar em antecipado, traremos nossa análise também. Pessoal, obrigado por tudo, por ter acompanhado até aqui. Eu realmente queria assistir esse conteúdo junto de vocês. E comenta pra mim qual o tamanho do seu hype. Valeu, até mais. Tchau, tchau.